Well, once again, we're back and we're getting ready to go on to chapter 20. And this may be a long chapter, so uh, get ready because we're going to buckle in for it. Because here with Joel Barlow, these are things that are going to be brought out by, yes, J.T. Headley, as he put this together and published it in 1864. What is the name of the book? What is it? Yes. The Clergy. Uh-uh-uh, not the clergy. Let's try it backwards again. The Chaplains and Clergy of the Revolution, published in 1864. All right, here we go. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right, here we go. His birth and early education, a friend of Dwight, his poem, The Prospect of Peace, joins the army in vacations, becomes chaplain, writes patriotic ballads, hymns for the Yankee rebels, the burning of Charlestown, occupation in the army, friend of Washington, sermon on Arnold's treason, becomes a lawyer and editor at Hartford, Connecticut, revives Watts' psalms and hymns, agent of the Skeeto Land Company, visits England, France, becomes enlisted in the French Revolution, his occupations in Europe, council at Algiers, makes a fortune in France, returns to America, remarkable prophecies in his columbide, ministers to France, or a minister to France, his death, charge of religious apostasy. Mr. Barlow occupied so prominent a place before the public after the revolution that but little has been written of his career as a patriot. Indeed, there is a great dearth of details respecting his life in the army, for his own papers are silent on the subject. He was the youngest son of ten children and was born in Reading, Connecticut in 1755. He entered Dartmouth College in 1774, but before he finished his course, removed to Yale, where he became acquainted with Dwight, who was tutor there. And a warm friendship sprung up between the two young patriots and poets, entering with all the ardor of a youthful and impulsive nature into the revolutionary struggle, he spent his vacations in the army, fighting in the ranks like a common soldier. At White Plains, he distinguished himself by his bravery. He graduated in 1778 and, on commencement day, delivered a poem entitled, quote, The Prospect of Peace, end quote, which was published. His early poems breathed the spirit of true patriotism, and exhibited an unbound faith in the triumph of liberty, not only in this country, but throughout the world. Of America, he sang, quote, On this broad theater unbound spread, in different scenes what countless throngs must tread. Soon on the new-formed empire rising fair, Calms her brave sons now breathing from the war. Unfolds her harbor, spreads the genial soil, and welcomes freemen to the cheerful toil. End quote. After he left car college, Barlow commenced the study of law. But the Massachusetts line being in great need of chaplains, he abandoned it for theology, and after six weeks' study was licensed to preach and entered the army as chaplain. At the outset, he and Dwight and Trumbull and Humphreys and others frequently wrote patriotic songs for the soldiers and people, which were sung everywhere and had a powerful effect in animating the spirits of both. Barlow had great faith in popular ballads, and when he entered the army said, quote, I do not know whether I shall do more for the cause and the capacity of chaplain than I could in that of poet. I have great 
faith in the influence of songs, and I shall continue while fulfilling the duties of my appointment to write one now and then to encourage the taste of them which I find in the camp. One good song is worth a dozen addresses or proclamations. End quote. He carried out his resolution, and during the intervals of his arduous campaigns and on the fatiguing marches, composed many a stirring ode, which cheered and animated the soldiers, writing not for fame, but to kindle patriotic feeling. He took no pains to let their authorship be known, and hence the most of his revolutionary ballads have passed into oblivion or exist as anonymous infusions. Those written by New England patriots were stigmatized as, quote, psalms and hymns adapted to this taste of Yankee rebels, end quote. Among these, we find one written by Barlow entitled, here's the title, The Burning of Charlestown. After enlarging on the atrocity of the act at some length, he closes with the following prophetic denunciation. Quote, and here it is. So what happened was is this is only going to give the end part of that song. And here's how the ending of it goes. Quote, Nor shall the blood of heroes on the plain who fell that day in freedom's cause Lie unrevenged, though with by thy thousand slain, whilst there's a king who fears no minds thy law. Shall Cain, who madly split his brother's blood, receive such curses from the God of all? Is not that sovereign still as just and good to hear the cries of children when they call? Yes. There is a God whose laws are still the same, whose years are endless, and whose power is great. He is our God. Jehovah is his name. With him we trust our sore oppressed state. When he shall rise, O oh, Britain, dread the day, nor can I stretch the period of thy fate. What heart of steel! What tyrant then shall sway a throne that's sinking by oppression wait? Thy crimes, O North, shall then like specters stand, nor Charlestown hindmost in thy ghastly row. And faithless Gage, who came to dread command, shall find dire torments gnawn upon his soul. Yes. In this world we trust those ills so dread that fill the nation with such matchless woes shall fall with double vengeance on the head nor scape those minions which thy court compose. End of the quote. Barlow's whole soul was so enlisted in the struggle that he seemed to have lost sight of his individual prospects in the future of his country. Although serving as a chaplain in the army, he evidently had no design of following the clerical profession for life. He pursued it from a sense of duty in the existing emergencies as the best way he could serve the cause of liberty. He had remained a clergyman after the close of the war. The personal incidents connected with his career as chaplain would doubtless have been preserved with greater care. But his subsequent public life ran in such an entirely opposite channel with which these seemed to have no connection that they were mostly overlooked and the papers containing them perhaps destroyed by himself. Only now and then we get a glimpse of him, always at his post, always confident and courageous, and endeavoring to infuse his spirit into others. We see the young poet and preacher looking sadly but approvingly on the execution of Andre, and as the body of the brave but still ill-fated officer swings in the air, saying to those around him, 
It is heaven's own justice. Soon after, he preached at West Point a sermon on the treason of Arnold, in which the vengeance of God was proclaimed against all those who dared to lift a traitorous hand against their oppressed country. The exalted, fearless, patriotic spirit of the chaplain won the heart of Washington, and he invited him to dinner, placing him on his right hand while Sterling occupied the left. On another occasion, we find him on the anniversary of the Battle of Saratoga reciting an ode of his own composition with great eclat and giving a patriotic toast. Barlow's time, however, during the war was not wholly occupied in the discharge of his duties as chaplain, nor in his composing patriotic songs for the camp in the field. He also completed the plan of an elaborate poem entitled, quote, The Vision of Columbus, end quote, though it was not published until 1787. At the close of the war, he laid aside his clerical profession and returned to the study of law, settling in Hartford, Connecticut. At the same time, he edited a weekly newspaper called, quote, The American Mercury, end quote. He was admitted to the bar in 1785, and the same year was employed by the, quote, General Association of Connecticut, end quote, to correct and prepare Watts Psalms for the use of the churches under its charge. The work was satisfactorily performed and adopted in all the churches. Dwight's collection subsequently took its place. Quote, the Babylonian captivity, end quote, version of the 138th Psalm, so much admired, was one of these beginning, and here it is, the beginning of that psalm, quote, along the banks where Babel's current flow, our captive bands in deep despondence strayed, while Zion's fall in sad remembrance rose, her friends, her children, mingled with the dead, end quote. The profession of the law, however, did not suit the bent of his mind, and in 1788, he accepted the agency of the Scioto Land Company. So at the beginning, I messed that up because I couldn't see it. The print's real hard to read. The Scioto Land Company, and went to England to dispose of the property. But while engaged in negotiations, he discovered that the title to the land was stolen and the company a pack of swindlers, and he resigned his position. Having now nothing to occupy him, his attention was naturally directed to France, at the time fully launched on the sea of revolution, and he crossed over to Paris. His sympathies immediately became deeply enlisted for the noble Gerodians, and his love of liberty being in as extensive as human race, his whole soul was absorbed in this great yet wild struggle for man of man for his rights. Returning to England in 1791, he published the first part of his quote, advice to the privileged orders, end quote. And in February the following, a poem on quote the conspiracy of kings, end quote, or the unholy alliance against France. Hmm. Both of these productions were written in the vigorous style and bold, daring spirit which characterized him. The same year, he translated Volney's, and here's the title, quote, Runes and Reflections of the Revolutions of Empires, end quote, which was published in London. The next year, he was delegated by the Constitutional Society in England, of which he was a member, to carry an address to the French Convention, to which he had already written a letter. For the performance of his duty, the honor of French citizenship was conferred upon him. Soon after the execution of Louis XVI, he wrote the following ode, 
a parody on, quote, God saved the king, end quote. And here it is. This is what he wrote. His death. Fame, let thy triumph sound. Tell all the world around how Capet fell. And when great George's pole shall in the basket roll, let mercy then control the guillotine. When all the scepter crew have paid their homage to the guillotine, let freedom's flag advance till all the world like France or tyrant's grave shall dance and peace begin, end quote. The next year, he was made one of the deputations sent to organize the territory of Savoy. While here, he ad addressed a letter, quote, to the people of the Piedmont on the advantages of the French Revolution and the necessity of adopting its principles in Italy, end quote. At the time that he wrote a, a poem entitled, quote, The Hasty Pudding, end quote, with a de declaratory letter to Mrs. Washington. His brain seemed to be in the state of fusion, throwing off letters, addresses, poems, with astonishing rapidity, while outward occupation was as necessary to him as air. In 1795, he was appointed legal and commercial agent to the north of Europe, but was soon transferred to a field more congenial to his taste. Washington appointed him counsel to Algiers to negotiate a treaty with the Barbary States, or Barbary States, that was with the Arab, with the Barbary pirates and all of those that were uh, up there through Algiers and, and North Africa. <laughs> During Jefferson's time, we had to send the Marines in to kick their tail. Anyway, let me get back to this, is that Washington appointed him the Council to Algiers to negotiate a treaty with the Barbary States, which he successfully executed, exhibiting all the daring and energy of his nature in behalf of the American prisoners there. Returning to Paris, he made a fortune in some commercial speculations and purchased the hotel of the Count Clermont de Tonnerre, in which he lived in the style of a prince. In 1805, he returned to America and built a fine mansion in the District of Columbia, which he called Calorama. Calorama. I wonder if that's still there. I don't know. We'll have to look that up sometime. Anyway. Two years after his great work, the Columbiad appeared, dedicated to Fulton. And in this poem, which is an enlargement on the vision of Columbus, occur some of the most remarkable prophecies or anticipations found in uninspired writings. What that means is not biblical writings, so <laughs> just to make that a little clearer for everybody. As an example, Take the following prediction of the construction of the Erie Canal. Quote, From fair Albany toward the falling sun, Back through the midland, lengthening channels run. Meet the fair lakes, the boatuous towns that lave, And Hudson join to broad Ohio's wave. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, that's just totally amazing. This extraordinary description of the great internal work of New York State was written in 1787, when almost the entire country west of the Albany to Niagara was an unspoken wilderness. American literature furnished no parallel to this. Still more remarkable is the following prophecy of telegraphic communications. Here, quote, Ah, speed thy labors, sage of unknown name. Rise into light and seize thy promised fame. For thee the chemic powers, their bounds expand. The imprisoned lightning waits thy guardian hand. Unnumbered messages in viewless flight, 
shall bear thy mandates with the speed of light. End quote. I, I gotta say, my goodness, that, that could almost even talk about with the speed of light, the fiber optics and everything that we have today. So, I mean, just take that. And in, in, in 1864, they're talking about telegraph. Today, we, we look at that whole thing and just what we're doing in communications and in, in fiber optics. I mean, you know, Papa knows a lot about that. Anyway, let's move on. Still a lot more to go here. Uh, to one who read these productions in the beginning of this century, they must have appeared the incoherent utterances of a diseased imagination. And the last one been pronounced unintelligible nonsense. Now they are accurate descriptions of accomplished events. In the name of Erie Canal had been, oh, let me start that over again. If the name of Erie Canal had been inserted in the former and that Morris in the latter, they would scarcely have been more definite and complete. In language almost as clear and emphatic, he foretells Wilkes' discovery of a southern continent. Wow. And they're talking about Antarctica uh, in Wilkes' discovery. Anyway, let's go on. Always planning some new work, the moment one was finished, Barlow now meditated a history of the United States, but was cut short in his labors by being appointed minister to France under Monroe. So, wow, he... He, he went to Algiers under President Washington, and now he's appointed to France under Monroe. In October 1812, when Bonaparte was returning from his disastrous Russian campaign, he received an invitation to meet him at Wilna, and immediately set off in great haste. The fatigues and exposure of this journey brought on inflammation of lungs, and on his return to Paris, he died, December 22nd, at Zarnakwicka, a little village near Krakow. Wow, he died in Poland on his way back. Hmm. While lying sick here, he dictated at midnight a poem to his secretary entitled, quote, Advice to a Raven in Russia, end quote, a bitter denunciation of Bonaparte. Charges were made against Barlow that he became an infidel, though they were never proved. They arose from several causes. In the first place, Barlow foresaw the changes in religious tolerance and theological teaching which have since taken place in New England almost as clearly as he did those in material improvements. In uttering or Imitating these, he would inevitably be accused of infidelity, just as he was of incoherent ravings and is predicting the latter. He was too far in advance of his age to be tolerated by it. In the second place, no man could be transplanted from the heart of Puritan New England into the midst of the moral, so social, and religious chaos of the French Revolution without having his views on many points materially modified. But France was infidel, and hence all charges affected by the sojourn on her soil were set down at once as a result of infidelity. An argument short but incontro incontrovertible to the Puritan mind at the time. In the third place, his adoption of some scientific phrases and words used by the neurologist was equally convincing proof. In the fourth place, he was a friend of the French Revolution, which the Federalist of New England considered second only in atrocity to the wickedness to the apostasy of the angels. In the last place, and chiefly, he was a bitter anti-Federalist. Oh, a man of my heart! He was an anti-federalist. I love it. And a thorough, earnest Jeffersonian. This, though not infidelity itself, was its natural product. And as, quote, by their fruits ye shall know them, end quote, is sound doctrine 
in conclusion that Barlow was a skeptic was a skeptic was a logical conclusion that his views underwent great changes in event it could not be otherwise but we have nowhere seen the charge of having apostized from the faith of his father sustained by proof sufficient even to justify its being made. So, my children, the, the many aspects of what he did, and especially as we look at the conclusions of his life and the challenges that he made <laughs> to the Federalist in particular, would be looked at as the establishment nowadays, and even the establishment uh, evangelicals. We, we don't have any Puritans anymore in America in, in many respects. We have those that I, I will say there are a number of people that are um, Reformation-minded, that there are churches out there. There's some people that I know personally that are strong in those fundamental beliefs uh, and foundational beliefs. And to the extent that they are strong in those fundamental beliefs, uh, from the Sam Adams last Puritan perspective, as you know, when I view Sam Adams, he's the last Puritan in, in my mind. And uh, although there's many Reformation-minded people, the idea of the what an anti-federalist truly is, I can see, you know, why many in is, the establishment would call him an infidel. You know, pretty much what Papa's been called a lot of times too. I'll tell you. But uh, the, the, the point of it is that he, in other writings, when you go look at his writings, he predicted that what happened, Yale, Harvard, Princeton, all of those, he, he, and, and Dartmouth and so on, he predicted that they would accept the tolerance and the evils that they do today, that they did not stand strong on their faith, and they do not today, that they are now the infidels that he was called. You know, as, as Nana always says, you can point your finger at somebody, but look, you got three pointing back. So, you know, finger pointing is not really a good thing to do. And, uh, you know, here we had the so-called uh, Puritans of New England uh, the Federalist uh, taking and looking at it and going, whoa. And quite frankly, when it came to the French Revolution, uh, Sam Adams was very much against the French Revolution because he thought that it was godless. And, you know, quite frankly, that's, that's really the big differentiation between the American Revolution and the French Revolution is that, for the most part, the hand of God was in the minds of men and on their hearts so that it was a just war against religious and personal tyranny and despotism. It brought out the real liberty of what God intends us to live under. And so, uh, you know, that was very, very important. Whereas the uh, French Revolution was absolutely godless. God was not there at all. They had no spirit spiritual guidance, where we have here in this book, we're talking about the chaplains and clergy, where there was the spiritual guidance that was there uh, within the army, within the people, the majority of the people. So with that, uh, we'll kind of leave that one alone and continue on into the next chapter, which will be chapter 21 and uh, James Caldwell. So we'll get to James Caldwell next.